Okay, now we will jump into more practice problems, but we've shown the basic skills that are necessary for runtime analysis. Let's consider this practice problem. So we are given two nested for loops, and in these for loops, you'll notice that the innermost for loop doesn't go to n, it only goes to i. So we're going to trace through what happens when we do runtime analysis. So now the first thing that I want to tell you is that there may be times you see a problem that you're not sure how to handle, and it's perfectly okay for the first pass to do upper bounding of T of N in a way that is very crude and not so useful, but at least it's helpful. And we don't want to be making upper bounds that are silly or not useful, such as everything is big O of 2 to the N exponential. Well, that doesn't help us, but we try to do as well as we can and keep on bringing the upper bound as low as we can provably show. Okay, so first step. Let's see. I'm not sure how to handle this, so I'm just going to do a crude upper bound. And what I mean by that is, okay, I know this takes constant, and I don't know how to handle this j going from 0 to i minus 1, so I'm just going to do j's going from 0 to n minus 1, because I know how to handle that, and then I'm going, don't know how to handle the if, so I'm not going to deal with that, and now I'm going to just do the outer loop. I know how to handle the 0 going from n minus 1. So it's very clear, because I don't consider the fact that this inner uh, summation is going to represent this inner loop that's only going to i, so I know I'm doing an upper bound. and. When I do this, I can turn it into a closed form. So the inner loop is just adding c n times, and then we're multiplying that by n again because the outer loop is indexed by i is just adding n c n times. So I have t of n is bounded above by n squared by times c. And here, I would say that this is big O of n squared based on this analysis. And the reason for that, I'd say the big O, and I'm not so confident yet about the big omega, is because I ignored the number of steps on the inner loop that it's only going to i, and I ignored the if statement. So I know I have to be careful, but for a first pass, this is pretty good. Now, Let's see what happens if we are more precise. So now let me try this again. So this is, I'm going to call this a take one, attempt one. Now let's try to be more precise for attempt two. And now I am only going to ignore the if statement. So now I'm going to have my t of n, and I'm going to have right here my constant, and here I'm going to finally deal with this summation I was nervous about. So I say j goes from 0 to i minus 1, and then I am going to deal with this loop here. i goes from 0 to n minus 1. Okay, so now we've ignored the if statement, but we'll come back to that. So we still might be upper bounding getting a big O, but we might be able to convince ourselves that we have a tighter bound. So now we have to work a little bit to get the closed form. So now in this in loop indexed by J, or the summation indexed by J, we have, we're adding C I times, so I have I times C, and then we have our summation as I goes from 0 to N minus 1. Okay, so we're almost where we need with the summation, but we have to do a little bit more work in terms of how can we actually show what's being done. So you'll notice that in terms of the work, we actually do work for 
when i is equal to zero. So I'm going to do a little bit of change of indexing. It doesn't affect the bound, but I just want to show you why I'm doing the change of indexing now. And so I'm going to go from i equal to n for this. It didn't make much of it. It doesn't really make a, a difference in terms of the bound, but I just want to show the relationship to arithmetic series. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking the summation for i going from 1 to n of i times c. And the only reason why I was more careful here with the indexing of i is because when i, the variable i is equal to 0, we are actually going to be doing some work. Okay, so let's see what it is that we need to do. So you may recognize if we pull out the c that we have the arithmetic series that we know what to do with. Now from the arithmetic series, we know that this inner summation is just going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. And we can multiply this by the constant, but now you'll notice that we have t of n in a closed form. So now that we have an enclosed form, I'm going to switch to purple to give our bound, and our bound is going to be n squared. Now, we have to do a little bit more work because right now I've ignored the if statements, and this could affect the big omega, so that's why I was reluctant to put theta. But let's consider what is happening for the input to this snippet of code. So it's not going to behave the same for any matrix. So we can't make that argument because we have this if statement that says only run the inner loop if the value of ai0 is equal to 0. And that means that the values in the first column have to be 0. And when we do this consideration, what we found is that there exists a matrix, namely matrix with all zeros in the first column such that the inner loop will always run. And that implies that there exists a matrix requiring at least big omega of n squared steps for that code. So since we've shown that we have big O of n squared just by tracing and ignoring the if statement, and we've shown that there exists a matrix such that the if statement will always be true and we always have to run that inner loop, we can now change our big O to theta of n squared. Let's consider another example with nested for loops and an if statement. So in our first attempt, we're going to consider the work that we need to check the if statement, but we are going to assume it's always true. So let's look at our first attempt. So this is attempt one. So we have T of n is going to be at most. So let's look at this inner loop. So this inner loop is going to be constant amount of work to update the matrix. And then we have the for loop indexed by j. So that's going to be j equals 0 to n minus 1. We'll do a constant amount of work. And then we have to pay the work to check the if statement. So here, that's going to be another constant, some other constant amount of work. 
and we're going to do all of this work checking the if statement and running the inner for loop for our outer for loop which is indexed by i and i is going to go from 0 to n minus 1 okay so we have an expression for t of n but it's not in closed form so let's put it in closed form now so when we put it in closed form so we have this inner for loop which is represented by the summation indexed by j so we're adding c n times so we're going to have c n and then we have the constant for checking i and then we're doing this summation as i goes from 0 to n minus 1 and when we just deal with the summation we are going to add c2 n times so we're going to have n times c2 and then we're going to be adding c times n n times so that's going to give us c times n squared and we now have t of n or the bound of t of n in closed form so now we can put this in asymptotic notation and we just have to worry about the upper bound and that is going to be just n squared. The dom dominant term there is just n squared. Okay, so now we know that this is an upper bound because we did not consider when the if statement would be true or not. We assumed that it was always true and that we always had to run the inner for loop. So now we can be a little bit more precise. So now let's consider our attempt two. So this is not wrong. Attempt one is not not wrong, it's just not most right. So we want to see if we can get a lower upper bound. Attempt two. So now for our attempt two, we are going to consider, we're going to break it into two parts. So we're going to have t of n is going to be the work to check the if statement plus the work of the inner loop inside. So it's going to be the work to check plus the work within the inner for loop. And so here we're not assuming that the if statement is always true. So that's why we separated them out. So now the work to check the inner for loop. So if it will be run or not. So that's to check the if statement. So that's a constant amount of time and I know that I'm going to do that for every iteration of the outer for loop. So i goes from 0 to n minus 1. But now when that inner loop is true, I'm going to call that L is the number of times it's true. But when it's true, I am going to just do the work of the inner loop, which we can see is just a constant to update aij and the inner loop is going from 0 to n minus 1. So when this inner loop runs, I am going to do a constant amount of work for each iteration. But now I have to figure out what this L is, where L is the number of times this inner loop is run. And another way to think of this is the number of times the if statement is true. Okay, so let's think about this. When, for what eyes is this if statement going to be true? So we can see this if statement is only true if i is equal to 1. So in this, this in particular, we have l is equal to 1. So now let's consider what happens. So now we have a good bound for t of n. We have t of n is equal to i, summation is i goes to 0 to n minus 1 of the constant amount of work that we do to check the condition of when the inner loop was going to run. That condition is only going to be true exactly once when i is equal to 0. And when that's true, we run the inner loop, which is j going from 0 to n minus 1 of a constant amount of work. And now 
we have t of n expressed in terms of the summation. So now we have to put them in closed form. So for the first summation indexed by i, we are adding c to n times. So we have, so excuse me, c1 n times. And then for the second summation, we are adding c2 n times also. So we have n times c2 for that as well. And when we simplify this, we just get constant times n, and we can then apply our asymptotic bound to get big O of n. And the reason why I know I can change this to a theta of n is because it's the same for any input. So this becomes theta of n because this code will run the same for any input.